Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 196. It is Family History Month here in the U.S. It's October 2016, and I am on the road every weekend teaching at seminars and conferences from coast to coast. It's been a blast, but today I'm home, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you in this episode about the things that can really make a difference to your family history research. And we have a packed show, so we're going to jump right into the genealogy news Save the dates and start planning. There's two major conferences coming up in 2017. Early bird registration for Roots Tech 2017 is now open at rootstech.org. Last year, more than 28,000 people attended what's become really the biggest family history event in the world. The dates this year are going to be February 8th through the 11th, 2017 at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. So early bird pricing is $159, and that's for a four-day pass, and $189 for the Roots Tech plus the Innovator Summit Pass, which gets you into the Innovator Summit Day. So over the course of those four days, there'll be over 200 class sessions, including my own classes. I'm going to be talking about Google Books. Uh, We're also going to do a session on creating a Google Earth map collection, which is really fun, and also one on seven awesome apps to eliminate the eye rolling when you share your family history with those non-genealogists in your family. And GEMS team members, Sonny Morton, Diane Southerd, and Amy Tennant are also going to be teaching classes. So there will be a contingent of us from Genealogy Gems teaching classes throughout Roots Tech. We would love to see you there. And for the beginner or the bargain hunter, you can also buy a getting started pass. That's just $49 for one day, and you can do $69 for three days. That will get you into a set of classes that are just for beginners and those who want to focus on basic skill building. For example, I've been asked to teach a getting started class on kind of getting organized. Uh, This is one I've kind of had in the works for a long time. I'm really excited to make it part of this getting started beginner pass. And GEMS editor Sonny Morton is teaching a getting started class that compares the big four genealogy websites, Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And Diane Southern, she's going to be teaching three DNA lectures in that getting started track. So we will definitely be a part of that. And all of the passes, no matter which one you pick, get you access into the expo hall. That's where all the action happens. And where my entire Genealogy Gems team is going to be when we're not teaching you'll find us at our booth. So I'll keep you posted about events and presentations that we're going to be hosting at the Genealogy Gems Theater in our newly expanded booth. So we will see you there. And a little further in the future, but now open for hotel reservations, is FGS, the Federation of Genealogical Societies, their 2017 conference. That's going to be held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the weekend of August 30th through September 2nd. I had a great time at FGS 2016, and I can't wait to go back. So blocks of hotel rooms are available at a reduced rate, and the rates are good for a few days before and after the conference as well. So if you want to go a little early, stay a little late, do a little research, it's easy to do at those conference rate prices. And it's a beautiful time of year to see the sites in Pennsylvania or just travel around to the Great Lakes or Niagara Falls. Next up, we've got some book club news from Sunny Morton. Hello, Sunny Morton here, Genealogy Gems editor and book club guru. I'm actually not here to announce the new Genealogy Gems book club title. Lisa will do that herself later in the show. But I wanted to let you know that British author Nathan Dylan Goodwin, who we featured and loved a while back in the book club with his novel The Lost Ancestor, has a new novel out in the same forensic genealogy mystery series. It's called The Spyglass File, and in it we find our hero Morton Farrier on the trail of his client's newly discovered biological family. 
That trail leads to the fascinating story of a young woman who provided valuable but secret service during World War II and who unknowingly became an entry in the mysterious spyglass file. The spyglass file connection is still so dangerous today that Morton's going to have bad guys after him again, and he may or may not get himself kidnapped right before he's supposed to marry the lovely Juliet. Meanwhile, you'll find him anguishing over the continuing mystery of his own biological roots, a story that unfolds just a little more in this new book. That's The Spyglass File by Nathan Dillon Goodwin, and Lisa will link to it in the show notes and on our website. Don't miss it. It's a fun read. But it's another author's turn for the book club. And as I said, Lisa will tell you more about that book later in the show. All right. Well, that's it for the news. And now it's time to hear from you. And we will do that at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes From my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter From that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad that we are winning and I bet he's glad but more than any other a line from my old mother bring me a letter from my hometown First up here in the mailbox, we have a school record suggestion. Now, after hearing my tips for researching your ancestors' school records in the Genealogy Gems podcast, it was episode number 194, Laura wrote in with this follow-up suggestion. She said, for those that have these old school records, consider donating them, even a digitized image, to the school from whence they originated. I shared class photos taken in the 1940s with my parents' grade schools. The school was so appreciative. I hope another researcher down the road benefits from the pictures as well. Great idea. We all have that in our own archive, basically, in our own scrapbooks. And so why not send them over and share them with some of those schools, particularly the ones that are still around? What a wonderful suggestion. And I mentioned to you at the beginning of the show that there were some strong opinions about ancestral gossip. So for this mailbox item, picture my mailbox crammed full of letters. Recently, I did share an email exchange that I had with Jennifer on my blog and in my weekly newsletter, which if you're not getting the weekly Genealogy Gems newsletter, head to genealogygems.com and sign up. You need to. That's how we stay in touch and get all the goodies to you every week. Now, I have heard from so many of you on this topic, and here's Jennifer's question first, and my response, and some of your responses. So Jennifer wrote, Hi, Lisa. I love your blog and podcast. Thank you for all you do and getting gems together for us. You are welcome, Jennifer. She says, I have a question for you, and I would love to know your opinion. I was recently at a family wedding. I printed out all of the family and ancestor paper trails and documents and was passing them around to my aunt, uncles, and cousins. My mom's eldest brother brought up a memory he had of his grandfather, my great-grandfather, a German immigrant. My uncle whispered to me because the saying my great-grandfather often said is very prejudiced. I won't tell you what the quote is, but it is prejudice against Jewish, Irish, and Dutch people. Here's my question. Should I write down that my great-grandfather was prejudiced against certain people to preserve this part of his character, or should I let this information fade into history? As genealogists, we're always trying to get a full view of the person we're researching, past the census records, military service paperwork, and wills, and into the real person and personality. So now I have a more broad view of my great-grandfather, but it's negative. Should I preserve this character flaw in my ancestry notes? I'm conflicted, unquote. 
And Jennifer added a PS at the end of her email. She said, in the following generations, this man's children and grandchildren have married Irish and Jewish spouses. So I guess the saying was never echoed by his descendants. Well, this is a great question. And I really applaud Jen for thinking so thoughtfully about it and asking for advice. Now, her question again was, should I write down that my great grandfather was prejudiced against certain people to preserve this part of his character? Or should I let this information fade into history? No. Mother Lisa says, this is gossip. And you didn't hear it straight from your great grandfather. I certainly wouldn't want anybody else attributing a comment to me if I didn't have the chance to rebuke it or to at least to review it. Uh, it's, it's a really slippery slope to do that. And essentially, even when the person is deceased, if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, this is what they said, it's really gossip. And you don't really know if it's true. And in truth, you don't really know the motivation of the person who's telling you, Right. Um, who knows if they had some kind of a run-in with them or if there was something that was passed down through their family. You never know. It could also be that they were telling a joke, right? And back in the day, I mean, I remember growing up and they used to have, they called them Polak jokes, po- jokes about Polish people. Now, not very nice, right? Uh, and the term wasn't very nice. Archie Bump- Bunker used to say that all the time on All in the Family, But the truth was, back in the 70s, it was a lot more normal that people would say ethnic jokes, tell ethnic jokes. And uh, in today's world, we're a lot more PC, the world tends to be, and we tend to be very cautious and careful and very concerned about hurting other people's feelings. And that's important. Um, I think each of us has to make decisions about that, what we, you know, we feel like, you know, we're, we're doing insane. But the reality is, You can't go back and judge 40 or 50 years ago and say, uh, I'm going to apply exactly my standards today to something when you were not part of the context of what was going on back then. You didn't know what the mores were. You didn't know how people uh, felt and what they said and what was kind of considered normal. It didn't make you cringe like maybe it makes you cringe today. So it is a slippery slope. And you know, the question was, should I preserve this character flaw in my ancestry notes? And that's a slippery slope, right? Because I believe that really that we in modern times should avoid sitting in judgment of somebody who's not here to defend themselves. And we don't want to presume that we're in a position to decide how wrong the crime is. Uh, She's already kind of in a sense said, you know, I see this as a character flaw. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it wasn't as much in the time as it is today. Um, But that's really, it's a challenging role to try to take on to say, I'm going to decide that and therefore document it in that fashion. We certainly don't want to be negatively prejudiced against others ourselves, right? But it's impossible to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes in another time and another circumstance. We know nothing about what the person really said, uh, whether they were joking, whether the person who heard something and passed it on had an axe to grind, or whether there was even an experience that our ancestor might have suffered that could have in any way legitimately given him a reason to gripe based on his own personal experience. So in my book, we chalk this up to gossip and we move on. Because what goes around comes around. And let's hope that it prevents also an occurrence of someone gossiping about you and your future descendant spreading it into the ages. Now, I got some feedback from this. Gail wrote in to say, I just want to thank you for this wonderful advice. And it's something you come across from time to time when doing family history. And I found your suggestions very wise and fair to all concerned. I appreciate that. Uh, Jim from Saratoga, California wrote in, Lisa, I could not agree with you more concerning this topic of gossip and hurtful information. I also believe it's extremely important that we consider our ancestors' actions or words in context with the time they lived. Otherwise, we are doomed to lump all of our ancestors into the group of evil bigots. This is especially true for those of us with folks from the South. A beautiful answer to a painful question. Thank you for your sensitivity. 
Another comment came in from California, this one from Stephanie. She says, I've been doing genealogy research since 1988, spurred on by the discovery of some old letters that my great-grandmother had written to my mother, who was pregnant with me, regarding our family history way back to the Civil War era. During all these subsequent years of research, I've discovered, as you stated, the good, the bad, and the ugly, sometimes in surprisingly unforgettable ways. For me, the litmus test is... For this is just as you stated, who will it benefit? Who will it harm? Then I go from there as to whether I'll make it public or keep it private. And lastly, again, as you said, always, always cite the source. And it's so true. We need to cite our sources. That was something that I emphasized in the newsletter when I wrote about this. And those questions that she mentioned are important ones. Who will it benefit? Who will it harm? I would even add another question, which is, and what's your motivation in documenting it? It's kind of something that comes up a lot with adoption situations, right? Or when you find out that somebody's not the parent of so-and-so. And they're part of it is, oh my gosh, I made a discovery. But in the end, we're talking about people, right? People we care about. Even, even if they're people we don't care about, it's still matters that they're people and they have lives to live or memories to keep. And um, we have to ask ourselves, and just more than anything, take the time. There is no rush to let the cat out of the bag or to document everything. Better to take our time and really ask ourselves those questions as well as make sure that we think about it in context from the time that it happened. David's response has two stories in it. And he says, I have similar experiences to what you just sent me in the newsletter, and I know some of these sensitivities can be concerning as to how much to share and with whom. On researching with my cousin who lives across the pond in New Zealand, me being in Australia, we stumbled upon the second marriage of one of my great-great-grandmothers, and she remarried after her husband died. The scary part was that she showed up in, quote, legal proceedings to do with bigamy. The cad she had married was still married to another woman in North Queensland. The marriage was annulled, and she was not being held legally responsible, as she had no knowledge that the man she married was still married. My dear cousin and I came to the executive decision. This scoundrel who tricked our dear relative did not belong on our family tree. For a few weeks, we had a less than favorable view of my dear great-great-grandmother until we were able to clear her good name, as it were, in our recordings. Such a sad story to think she found love again only to have it destroyed like that. Another scare was going to a local police courthouse to apply for the death certificate of my great-great-grandfather, the deceased first husband of the same lady we cleared. And even the police officer remarked on the place of death being Bago Road, touting that I may not like what I find. Boggle Road was the local address of the prison here in Brisbane, which was shut down some decades ago. It was indeed a joyous relief to find out that my great-great-grandfather was not a crook or criminal. The family actually lived at a number 10 Boggle Road, which was not the jail. Phew. So he was not to be found buried in the local jail cemetery after all. There are some more sensitive things that I keep under wraps, and I do try not to judge people as I've not had their lives, and in some cases can understand why their lives took the direction that they did, unquote. Gosh, it would have been so easy for David to seize upon the Boggle Road information and draw the wrong conclusion, wouldn't it? Thoughtful patience and solid generational investigation wins the day again. Good for you, David. Next, Sheila's response, which included the following comment, and I quote, I'm not condoning prejudice, but I am saying that in most instances, people were a product of their environment. And if the community was small and contained, most people didn't travel far in olden days, they held a fear of anything different. I am saying that if you start noting that your ancestor was prejudiced, you will have to note that each of his and her neighbors were too, unquote. Gosh, that's a great point. I mean, in reality, it'd be really easy. There are some people who live in today's society who would absolutely say everybody was prejudiced. Everybody was awful. Yeah, that's hindsight is 2020, right? 
Okay, Alice gets the last word in this conversation today as she expands on the same idea as Sheila. And Alice says, I agree with your assessment about what to do with gossip, not to publish something that you have no verification for. However, I think there is a deeper issue here about great grandpa, and that is to consider the era and the country in which he lived and from which he immigrated. Fortunately, we've evolved in our views of societal mores, and we must not judge our ancestors by the standards that we currently live by. For example, almost everyone in the South supported slavery 150 years ago, and our white slave-owning ancestors did not consider their slaves as anything other than, quote, property. In fact, the Presbyterian Church split in the mid-1850s because they couldn't resolve the slavery issue. Were these white people prejudiced? You betcha. But that was the way of life then. In 13th century Germany, the Jews were thought to have caused the Black Plague and pogroms were held to rid town of these vile germ-carrying people. In the middle of the 20th century, more pogroms were held to rid Germany from its Jews. In fact, 80% of the towns who had pogroms in the 1900s were the same towns who distrusted the Jews in the 13th century. These prejudiced views were handed down for 600 plus years. Were these German people prejudiced? You betcha. But that was the way of life then. Even 20 years ago, U.S. citizens ranted and raved about homosexual folk, and we have rapidly rethought our stance. Were we prejudiced? You betcha. But that was the way of life then. So I'm willing to bet that our ancestors held many of the same prejudices that were prevalent at the times that when they lived. And we as researchers need to present their lives in terms relevant to that time and not in terms of how we view things today. We are making progress. We are improving in our moral judgments, but we have a long way to go. The least we can do is evaluate our ancestors by the standards that were prevalent at the time that they lived. Unquote. Wow. The responses I received from so many of you were both passionate and really compassionate. Thanks to Jen for asking such a good question to prompt all these letters. A while back, Jen sent me a lovely pendant that she made custom made with a stamp in it. And I still wear it and I get lots of compliments on it. Um, And I'll have a picture of it in the show notes because uh, she puts together some really neat, they call it upcycled vintage jewelry. And I'll have some links to that as well. And along with links to this conversation online. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter I'm a firm believer in taking responsibility for the life and the future of my genealogy data. So instead of only uploading my information to somebody else's genealogy website, I enter it into my own master database that's on my own computer into the premier genealogy software program. It's Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Genealogy software is Roots Magic's primary focus. It's not just a sideline with them. And I continue to be really impressed by their free online training videos and all the rich features that they continue to add. And here's the latest. Not only can you import a JetCom file from another program, but now with the release of Roots Magic 7.1, you can directly import any Family Tree Maker file with everything attached. In fact, Roots Magic can import a bigger variety of older Family Tree Maker files than any single version of Family Tree Maker itself. It's just one way that Roots Magic has been reaching out into the genealogy community, helping them care for their most precious data, their family tree. And there's even more to look forward to this year as Roots Magic has announced an agreement with Ancestry and will soon be able to synchronize your family tree with Ancestry the same way that Family Tree Maker did. There's never been a better time to switch to Roots Magic. Head to rootsmagic.com and download the free Roots Magic Essentials today. You know, now that I've moved to Texas and what they lovingly call Tornado Alley, 
I'm more aware than ever that if anything ever happened to my genealogy files, I would be devastated. And boy, have my files expanded since I started this research at the ripe old age of eight years old. As genealogists, we don't just have paper files anymore, but we also have digital files like our genealogy database and precious old photos that we've spent hours scanning. No matter where we upload our family tree or anything else relating to our family history on the web, the responsibility for the total safety and security of our files lies with us. That's why I'm so proud to announce that Backblaze is now the official backup of Lisa Louise Cook and Genealogy Gems. For the past few years, I've been researching and I've been test driving backup services and hands down, Backblaze is my choice. It's certainly the easiest service to use and I love their free app that allows me to access all my files on my smartphone and my tablet. Plus, it backs up everything, including my video files. Yikes, I didn't realize before looking at Backblaze that other services skip over backing up videos. So don't wait another day to ensure that all your files are safe and secure. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head to backblaze.com slash Lisa and scroll down. You'll see my smiling face there and a great offer. Just 50 bucks for a year's peace of mind and the best cloud backup around. Go to backblaze.com slash Lisa. There's nothing more satisfying than making a discovery about your family history. But sometimes obstacles get in the way, like hitting a brick wall in the like hitting a brick wall in an area of genealogical research, particularly in a challenging area that you're just not that familiar with. Irish research can be one of those areas where you need a little more expert help. If your goals are getting sidelined, hiring expert help can often be the most productive and actually sometimes cost-effective way to get past the roadblock. And that's why I'm so looking forward to sharing this next interview with you that I recorded with Kate Ekman, Senior Researcher at Legacy Tree Genealogists. It's a professional genealogy consulting firm in Salt Lake City. Kate holds a master's degree in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, with additional graduate work in history and education from Immaculata University, Lewis and Clark College, and Seattle Pacific University. Now, prior to embarking on her career as a professional genealogist, Kate spent 20 years as a college history professor, where she created interactive and participatory courses for her students, including a genealogically based study of U.S. history. Today, she's going to help us with our Irish research. But even if you don't have Irish ancestors, you're going to benefit from her know-how and her research methods. Plus, she's going to remove the mystery about how to hire a professional researcher, if and when you need one. So here's my conversation with Kate Ekman. Well, hi, Kate. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I've certainly gotten to know the folks over at Legacy Tree Genealogists, and I understand that you're one of their go-to Irish genealogists. And I'm kind of interested to know, how did you end up in the area of Irish genealogy as one of your specialties? Well, you wouldn't guess it from my last name because it's my husband's name, but I'm a very Irish. I have McConaughey's and Greys and all sorts of um, McElhaney's, all sorts of Irish family in my background. And so that's kind of what got me started in it, is trying to trace my family's Irish background and learning a lot of things about Ireland in the process as I did it. I bet. And and that's actually... A good thing to do, isn't it? To kind of get to know the country in general, what their records are, what their access laws are, all that kind of stuff. And I imagine once you dig into that, then it's it's just the next step to help other people do the same. Exactly. Once I started becoming more comfortable with Irish genealogy and more fluent with Irish history, it was much easier to know how to help other people track down their Irish ancestors. 
Well, I know we have a lot of folks out there who do have some kind of Irish in their background. And for some of them, they may have been working on it, may have taken a stab at it and kind of given up, or it is an area they haven't delved into yet, but they're kind of ready to get going. So I'm interested to know, where would you recommend that the hobbyists kind of start their Irish search? You're, you're right, Lisa. America has a huge number of people who identify as part Irish. I think it's something like 30 or 38 percent or something. So almost all of us feel like we're partly Irish. And the, one of the difficulties with Irish genealogy is there are not a lot of records that are available on sites that are for free. There are a few, though, that do have Irish records available for free, and those are great places to start. Of course, Family Search has a certain number of them. The National Archives of Ireland has just recently added quite a few new records that are available for free, including wills or will calendars. Most of the records were destroyed in the fire and the troubles in 1916. But there are some will calendars that list names of people that are available. The nationalarchives.ie is one place that you can go for free. There's another free site that I I like to go to. It's irishgenealogy.ie. They have civil records and some church records for some counties, but not all of the counties. And then Find My Past, well, they have a great selection of Irish records, and uh, some of those are available for free, and then sometimes they offer their entire collection for free for people to use as well. Great. So lots of online resources. Would you recommend that when somebody says, okay, I've like, I, I know I have my Margaret Scully, who's a great, great grandmother. Should I dive into those websites? Or are there some things that I need to know before I cross the pond, even if I do so just virtually? Well, it is helpful to know is it all possible where in Ireland the person was born? We sometimes don't know that. Unfortunately, in this country, most of the census records will just say Ireland. But if there's a way of knowing what county the person is from, that helps narrow things down so much because some counties have more records available than others. The other thing that's important or helpful to know when you start is, was your Irish ancestor Protestant or Catholic? We tend to think of Ireland as Catholic, but there's a large proportion in Northern Ireland of people who are Protestants, and that helps to focus your research as well. Great. And and that might be something certainly that we can discover in our own country. And, and we have listeners in the UK, in Australia, around the world. So they may be having their own sets of records to look at in their location, and then they can kind of jump on to some of these um, online websites as well. Exactly. If you didn't know the county, and let's say we're here in the U.S., and I didn't know what county that Margaret Scully was born in, where would you recommend that I look here in the in U.S. records? We know the census pretty much just says Ireland, so that I can, even if I'm going to come to a company like Legacy Tree or someone like you, that I can come armed with as much as possible to help you. Right. And the, that helps a lot. The more work that you've already done that you can share with us, the more efficient we can be. Of course, you're not going to have a a U.S. birth record for your Irish ancestor, but a death record might potentially provide more information than just the word Ireland. Uh, Unfortunately, oftentimes they just say Ireland, but sometimes counties are listed there. Or a death record might provide the names of the parents of your Irish ancestor, which is a huge help for being able to trace them once you get to Ireland. So a death record, a marriage record, similarly, some states and sometimes, as you know, ask huge amounts of information. They ask for the names of the parents, the places of birth, previous spouses. Others just simply have the bride and the groom's name and the date of the wedding. So those records are those normal vital records that were so useful for any kind of genealogy can be very helpful for tracking down your Irish ancestor. And then the other place to check is local church records, your Irish ancestor, whether they're Protestant or Catholic, wherever they settled in the United States or whatever country it is, as their children were born and baptized, christened, there may be records in the church 
that would give more specific information about where they were from. That's also a great place to use that extended family to find who the sponsors of those babies were to help learn the names of the siblings of your Irish ancestor. So by gathering not only the possibility of their birthplace, but who their parents were, who their siblings, the the cluster of people around that ancestor, that helps us build a pretty unique family. So a name like Margaret Scully, that's very, very common, actually becomes quite unique when surrounded by those particular parents, those particular siblings. And that gives us a group to look for in Ireland, right? That's exactly right. One of the things that I find very exciting about doing Irish ancestry, and of course, I can't say this is always the way it works, that this is always the way you can do things. But in Ireland, there are some traditional Irish naming patterns. And what's wonderful about those is they're particularly for sons, but it doesn't seem to matter whether it's a poor family or a noble family, whether they're Protestant or Catholic, they have these traditional Irish naming patterns that are very helpful. That's why collecting the names of the siblings or the parents can help you to track your ancestor to their family. In general, an eldest son is named after his paternal grandfather. The second son is named after the maternal grandfather. And then the third son is named for the father. And so if you only know who Margaret's siblings are, but you don't know who her parents are, then that might help you to be able to determine the names of her parents or her parents' families. Oh, that's great. And see, that's something that you know, after, you know, working for so long and so closely with an an area like this in Irish research. How about lastly, before we jump the pond, what should we be looking for? And I know naturalization and citizenship records are usually more current. Uh, If our ancestors immigrated decades and decades, if not centuries ago, that might be a challenge. But If by chance they did apply, or we do find a passenger list, that might also show at least the last place they lived. Exactly. Passenger lists can be very, very helpful, just as you said, because they'll tell us the last place they lived. Some passenger lists tell the names of, um, remember that that wonderful second page where we have the names of the parents, or I always think of it as the in case of emergency contact person back at home. (laughs) Right. Uh, And that's usually a mother or a father. Um, And they usually include an address of some sort. It might be a town, it might be a county. And then the same for who they're coming to stay with in this country is another avenue of additional family members that uh, we can start to build around that person. So naturalization records are wonderful. Passenger lists are sometimes even better, because they have the potential of offering so much more information. Exactly. I know with, uh, in fact, a great grandfather that wasn't Irish, but he was from Germany. And when I got his naturalization records, when he became a citizen here in the States, in the 20th century, it did name the village where he was born, which is pretty much the only place I've ever seen that name. So that could certainly happen for Irish as well. So we've, we've gathered all of this and done a lot of homework, but it's still a bit overwhelming and we're not physically in Ireland necessarily to do this work. At what point in this Irish research process do, particularly the hobbyist, somebody who's not doing this professionally, they're just doing it because they want to learn more about their family and, and have something to pass on to the rest of their family, where do they usually get stuck? Well, I think the place that they usually get stuck is, as you already alluded to with your ancestor, Margaret Scully, is it seems like there is a finite number of names that get used in Ireland. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> and we have, you know, you go looking on one of these websites and you type in a name that might seem to you is a pretty uncommon name. You know, we might think Fitzgerald or Fitzpatrick or any of those names. So those are common names. One of my long, long, long term clients that I've worked with for years, she was looking for someone named Mary Higgins. Well, Mary's pretty common, but I thought Higgins wouldn't be a terribly common name. Oh, no, there are lots of Mary Higginses that were born in Ireland at around the same time. And so that's usually what gets us in trouble is how do we figure out who the right person is from there? I have 15 different possibilities who were all born within a year of the time that my ancestor was born, how do I know which one's the right one? Exactly. Those common names, they can really get you. Mm -hmm. 
So we're dealing with that. And, and, and let's say that we've kind of built the cluster of people around them and, and we get over to into the Irish records. And, and so we see the uniqueness of that common name within the family unit. What other challenges are presented? Are there some records that just need to be found in, you know, accessed in person? Are we going to run into costs? Are there limitations on uh, what particular, if the Catholic Church doesn't necessarily make all of their records available? Well, and yes, the, the biggest problem that we run into from there, once, you know, if we get past the multiplicity of possibilities, it's the fact that most Irish birth and baptismal records, marriage records, death records, burial records, wills, census records were all destroyed in that uh, the PRO, the Public Refer- Record Office in Dublin in 1922. There was a, a huge fire that destroyed almost all of those. The country had begun gathering all the baptismal records from the churches. And so all the churches that had sent them to be held in the National Records Office, a central location, everybody who did that, they were all destroyed unless they made copies of them. So there's just so little census records that we are accustomed to having in the United States, in England, in other places. There's really nothing. They're just bits and pieces before 1901. And so we just don't have a lot of records that are available. And finding them is, it takes a lot of creative thinking and a lot of uh, other ways of looking at things. You start looking for land records. You start looking for court records. There are even one of the sets of records that is fun to look at, but also can be useful are dog licensing records that Find My Past has. That, you know, it's just some, it, you're, sometimes you're just looking for any little clue, something to help you figure out who's your relative or where were, where were they. Exactly. And I know for for many folks listening, they're thinking, gosh, you know, this Irish line I have, maybe it's just this one line of my family. And the idea of having to become an expert in an area that is, has so many challenges, that's kind of discouraging when it's only going to really affect this one small part of my tree. And here I'm trying to get familiar with all these other countries and types of records that affect other areas of my tree. So There are many reasons why a person might say, you know, I think I'm just going to get some help with this. And they come to you, right? Uh, Legacy Tree Genealogist has a collection of professionals who are real experts in their fields. When somebody comes to you, what's the process? I think it sounds a little bit intimidating if you have never hired professional help before because you don't really know what you're getting into. What's that like? We try to make the process as easy as we can. When you go to our website, we start out by asking you just what is it you want to know? And you can tell us as much or as little. Some people say, I'm trying to find my great grandfather and that's it. And then one of our managers will give you a phone call or talk to you by email, whatever you prefer, and ask more questions. What do you already know? What is it specifically that you'd like to find out? Do you have things you want to share with us, your research already? Maybe you even want to let us have access to your online family tree that you've created so that we can avoid duplicating the work you've already done to be as efficient and cost-effective as we can be for you. Once you and the manager have settled on exactly what it is that you want the researcher to accomplish, then it goes to myself or one of our other researchers, and we do all the work. Uh, We do the the searching. If there are documents that need to be ordered, we order those documents and provide you then with the results. We give you a written report of everything that we've done, where we've looked, what we found, and hopefully, most of the times we can end up saying, and here's who your great-grandfather was in Ireland and where he lived and provide you with that information. Oh, wouldn't that be exciting? Now, when somebody is going into this, they might have a limited budget. Uh, can you have parameters as far as I, I can do? Is it by hours? Is it by dollar amount? And can they say, here's how much I want to invest, get as far as you can, and then I'll try my hand at it again. Right. And we can do that. We have all sorts of packages and possibilities available. One of the more popular ones we have is a sort of an introductory, we call it a discovery package. It's only three hours. And what we're doing is looking to see, can we find something? Because sometimes with, especially with Irish genealogy, 
sometimes there really isn't going to be anything. If you've just had the terrible luck of everything has been destroyed that's related to your family, there's no sense in paying thousands and thousands of dollars to have somebody look at the same things over and over again. Yeah, exactly. Um, we can we can start out and do just a little bit of research and look and see what can we find. Maybe we can start with, oh, look, we found this one document which should lead us to more from there. Um, and so it gives you an idea of what we can do for you. It gives you an idea of what's available. And then you can decide from there. Yes, I think I can scrape together some more money. We even make available an option of including variety or multiples of your family to help pay for this. So perhaps you, a few siblings, an aunt or an uncle or a cousin can sort of all chip in together to pay for this research. So the whole family will benefit from it. That way, it's not all the burden isn't all on you to do that. Yeah, I could really see that, you know, at Christmas time, so often it's like, the kids get older, and you know, you're not buying them CDs every year like we used to when they were kids. <laughs> what, you know, what if we all get together and say, you know, we've donated, in a sense, towards the family history, you know, so here's your portion, here's your portion, and look what we've all discovered. And how wonderful that you can have like a discovery package where it's something that, because um, that's one of the biggest questions to me is, you know, uh, how do you know if somebody's just going off and spending hours and hours and hours, and they haven't really even identified to you what's even possible? And so I, I love that you guys do it in a way that really makes it accessible and affordable. And so you kind of know what the possibilities are and what you can kind of come to expect. And speaking of coming to expect, I, I know you've got some really cool stories of some of the research that you've done. And I'd love to hear one of your, what's one of your favorite tales of genealogical research? One of my favorite stories was one of my first Irish projects that I worked on. This was a, a client who had a great grandmother named Mary Higgins. And she didn't know anything really else about Mary's family. We had, using U.S. censuses, knew about when Mary had arrived in this country, but we didn't know where she was from. We didn't know anything else. But we did start using those Irish naming traditions to look at family names and used census records, birth records, and eventually we found the right Mary Higgins from Kerry, County Kerry in Ireland. And what my client really wanted to do was get to know her Irish family. And so when I was able to provide her, not only with here is Mary's parents and brothers and sisters, but I've traced the family of her brother, one of her brothers forward in time, and here is the address of your living second cousin, and let her be able to contact him, write him a letter, and, and begin that new part of their family, because neither one of them had ever known the other existed until that point, and it it was so exciting for her. It was exciting for me. She got to share that with her grandson. Here's this whole new aspect of your family that, that we never knew existed, your, your Irish family. And that was so wonderful because it was a lot of work. And she had spent almost her entire adult life trying to find Mary Higgins in Ireland. And to be able to finally put a place for her family was very rewarding for both of us. For all of us. I can imagine. I mean, and, and there does come a point, uh, I have some of those in my own research where you, you've just spent so much time. And at some point, it's like, I just kind of want to make a leap so that I can still in my lifetime, uh, spend some time enjoying and reaping the benefits of f knowing this information. And like you say, connecting with with cousins and other families, it's just tremendous. And sometimes that leap happens with help. And that's, I think, what Legacy Tree Genealogist does. And Kate, I really appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise, because I know there are some folks who, who want to still continue on for a while, but then when they're ready, they'll know how welcoming that you folks are and how easy the process is to really define a way to work together that makes sense uh, financially and time-wise. And then to think that you could really, you know, take a leap forward and really reap the benefits of knowing the family history is just tremendous. Uh, I thank you so much for taking the time out and being here today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. I really enjoyed it. You know, that conversation with Kate is a really good reminder that at some point, we do all hit brick walls in our research. 
we may need to enlist the help of an expert in finding that overseas hometown, or once we get there, in navigating another language or records that we don't know very well. That's when we might want to call on a pro, either to take over the helm or just to steer the ship temporarily through the rapids, so to speak. That's why I'm really thrilled that Legacy Tree has shared a special offer with us, an exclusive coupon code for Genealogy Gems fans. So their Legacy Tree Discovery Package starts with that free consultation, and it gives you three and a half hours worth of their time, which they'll spend doing a preliminary analysis on your research problem and giving you research recommendations. Now, that's normally $100 an hour, but with our coupon code SAVE50, that's one word, S-A-V-E-5-0, you're going to save $50 off expert input from someone like Kate. So to get that offer, go to the Genealogy Gems page on the Legacy Tree website at LegacyTree.com slash Genealogy Gems and use your coupon code SAVE50 to save $50 on your purchase. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on MyHeritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at MyHeritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Hello, Genealogy Gems listeners. This is Diane Southard, your DNA guide. I don't know about you, but I can tell whose turn it is to unload the dishwasher at my house by just looking at the state of the silverware drawer. If either of the boys have done it, they're ages 13 or 11, the forks are haphazardly in a jumble and the spoon stack has overflowed into the knife section and the measuring spoons are nowhere to be found. If, on the other hand, it was my daughter, age 8, everything is perfectly in order. Not only are all the forks where they belong, but the small forks and the large forks have been separated into their own piles, and the measuring spoons are nestled neatly in size order. Regardless of the state of your own silverware drawer, it's some sort of direction when it comes to organizing our DNA test results. Organizing your matches entails more than side or known connections versus unknown connections. Organizing your results involves making up use. Good organization for your test results can help reveal or refine your genealogical goals and help you determine your next steps. The very first step is to download your raw data from your testing company and store it somewhere on your home computer. I have instructions on my website. Once that's complete, we can get down to the match list. One common situation for those of you who have several generations of ancestors in the United States is that you might have some ancestors seem to have produced a lot of descendants who have caught the DNA testing bug. This can kind of be like your overflowing spoon stack, and it may be obscuring some valuable matches like those knives. 
But identifying and putting all of those known matches in their proper context can help you realize that these abundant matches may lead to clues about descendant lines of your known ancestral couple that you weren't aware of. In my Organizing Your DNA Matches Quick Sheet, I outline a process for drawing out the genetic and genealogical relationships of those known connections to better understand their relationship to each other and to you. It's then easier to verify that your genetic connection is aligned with your known genealogical paper trail, and it can help you spot areas that might need more research. This same idea of plotting the relationships of your matches to each other can also be employed as you're looking to break down a brick wall in your family tree, or even in cases of adoption. The key to identifying unknowns is determining the relationships of your matches to each other so you can better see where you might fit in. Another helpful organization tool is a trick I learned from our very own Lisa Louise Cook, and that's Google Earth. Have you ever tried to use Google Earth to help in your genetic genealogy? Remember that the common ancestor between you and your DNA match has three things that connect you to them. You have their genetics, the surnames, and locations. We know the genetics is working because, well, they're showing up on your match list. But oftentimes, you can't see a shared surname among your match. However, by plotting their locations in the free Google Earth tool, it's kind of like separating the big forks from the little forks. You might be able to recognize a shared location that would identify which line you should investigate for that shared connection. So what are you waiting for? Line up those spoons and separate the big forks from the little forks, and your organizing efforts just might reveal a family of measuring spoons all lined up and waiting to be added to your family history. I'm interested to learn how you're using your organization tools to better attack your genetic genealogy. As always, you can reach me by email at guide at your DNA guide.com. Genealogy Gems podcast, but not quite. As our book club guru, Sonny Morton, mentioned earlier in the show, I have the lovely job of announcing our next pick in the Genealogy Gems book club. We're mixing things up a little this quarter in a couple of ways. We've chosen to spotlight an author rather than one single book. And we've decided to let this author and her lifestyle inspire a theme for us here at Genealogy Gems for the coming holiday season. In fact, Genealogy Gems is going Victorian. From now through the end of the year, you'll find Victorian-inspired crafts, recipes, decor, fashions, and more on our Instagram and Pinterest sites, which of course we'll link to regularly from the Genealogy Gems website, newsletter, podcast show notes, and our Facebook page. Nobody does sumptuous holiday traditions quite like the Victorians, and we look forward to celebrating that. Representing all things Victorian will be our featured book club author, Sarah Chrisman. Now, maybe you've seen her as a guest on The Morning Show in Australia, in The New York Times or Good Housekeeping Magazine, the UK's Daily Mail, Inside Edition, or any other number of media appearances. Or maybe you've come across her best known book, Victorian Secrets, what a course it taught me about the past, the present, and myself. Sarah and her husband Gabriel live in the U.S. in Washington State, but they also have chosen to live in the past, more specifically in the Victorian era. Now, this isn't just a temporary experiment either. They live like this, uh, like it's about 1889 the year their house was built, all year long. They wear Victorian-style clothing, and they use a wood-burning stove and antique icebox. And Sarah says, quote, We are not actors playing dress-up, but just ordinary people choosing to insert as much of history into our present as we can, and using our experiences to teach others, unquote. Sarah wears a corset day and night, year-round, which she wrote that memoir about, 
And her husband wears 19th century glasses, including 1850s green sunglasses. No TV, no cell phones, and Sarah isn't even a licensed driver, though she and Gabriel both love riding those elegant, tall Victorian-era bicycles with the enormous wheel. So, her books, because of course, this is a book club. Sarah has written several books, and you know, I'm going to ask you to choose which one to read, because any of them will be great background for our conversation. I already mentioned her memoir. It's called Victorian Secrets. The book I chose to read and I'm going to talk about with her is called This Victorian Life, Modern Adventures in 19th Century Culture, Cooking, Fashion, and Technologies. It's her memoir of what it's like to live like she does, not just the corset wearing, but much more. And she's also written True Ladies and Proper Gentlemen, Victorian Etiquette for Modern Day Mothers and Fathers, Husbands and Wives, Boys and Girls, Teachers and Students, and more. And if you're not into historical fiction, she's written some lighter hearted novels, including a couple of which she dubs her Victorian cycling club romances. Now, I'm doing the book club interviews with Sarah that are going to air in December, partly because I love Victorian styling and partly because, and you may already know this about me, uh, I did live for a season in the past myself. My family and I were on Texas Ranch House, uh, oh gosh, over a decade ago. It was a PBS reality TV series. Uh, it was all about what it was like to live on the Texas frontier as a ranching family in the 1860s, right after the Civil War. So I wore a corset and I cooked over a fire for my family and I spent my days battling the heat and the prairie dust without electricity or running water. So Sarah and I, we have some things in common. You'll hear a short highlight of my conversation with Sarah in the December podcast in episode 198. Genealogy Gems premium members are going to find the whole interview on the premium podcast that month. So see the show notes or the Genealogy Gems book club page on my website for more about Sarah and her books. And I really want to thank you for using our links there on our website whenever you purchase any of Sarah's books. Because those purchases, when you use our links, help support this free Genealogy Gems podcast. And it supports the future Genealogy Gems programming, including the book club. And don't forget to watch for our favorite Victorian traditions on our social media pages, especially as we get closer to the holidays. We'll have links to all of them or just go to Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and you can search on my name, Lisa Louise Cook or the name Genealogy Gems. So make your selection from Sarah Christman's books and look forward to our Victorian content throughout this last quarter of 2016 and our full-length interview with Sarah Christman on the Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast. As I close episode 196, I'm reminded how close we are getting to our 200th episode. My, how time has flown. I have some favorite and fond memories of doing this show and some exciting ideas about what to do next. But I'd love to know what have been your favorite things about Genealogy Gems. Any particular topics or interviews or regular segments on the podcast that you like best? What keeps you coming back to listen? What would you like to hear more of? Let us know. I hope you will drop me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. You can also leave a voicemail at 925-272-4021. And thanks to the Genealogy Gems podcast production team for their work on this episode. Editor Sonny Morton, blogger Amy Tennant, and your DNA guide, Diane Southard, provided content. Vienna Thomas is the show's audio editor, and Lacey Cook provides additional support. I am your host and producer, Lisa Louise Cook. Find more of what we do at genealogygems.com. And I hope that you will share this podcast with your friends and folks who might just be thinking about checking into their own family history. Thanks so much for listening, friend. 
I'll talk to you soon.